midst of my confusion In the time of desperate need When I'm thinking not too clearly A gentle voice does it a scene Slow down, slow down, be still. Bishop and California Pacific Annual Conference. There it is. Good morning. <laughs> we gather this morning to be nourished by memory, to remember those who have gone before us and who are very much still a part of us, nourishing us for the future. Though we grieve the loss of loved ones, we also hold them with us each and every day keeping them alive as we remember them. And in doing so, we are reminded of the cycles of life and death which are present around us all the time. And so this morning, we will both remember those who have passed and will celebrate new life through baptism. And in holding both of these together, we are nourished by memory. The memories of our ancestors, the memories of our own baptisms, and the memory of Christ, who lives within each and every one of us. Hermanos, buenos días. Dios le bendiga a cada uno de ustedes en esta mañana. Mi nombre es Henry Carrasco, de la Iglesia Metodista Unida de Huntington Park. Vamos a leer la palabra del Señor en Mateo. 17, 1 al 5. Seis días después, Jesús tomó a Pedro, a Jacob y a Juan, su hermano, y los llevó aparte a un monte alto, y se transfiguró delante de ellos y resplandeció su rostro como el sol. Sus vestidos se hicieron blancos como la luz. He aquí, desaparecieron Moisés y Elías hablando con él. 
Entonces Pedro dijo a Jesús, Señor, bueno es para nosotros que estés aquí. Si quieres hagamos aquí tres enramadas, uno para ti, otro para Moisés y otro para Elías. Mientras él aún hablaba, una nube de luz los cubrió y he aquí una voz desde la nube que decía, este es mi hijo amado en quien tengo complacencia, a él oírle. Amén. wasn't on the screen, but that was our scripture for this morning. Uh, we're going to have it read in another language as well, um, if we can get the media team to put it on the screen so you can read along in English. Kim Lip Su. My name is Sam Sabong. from the Cambodia American UMC. I speak the Cambodia. Kiem chmo sbang sbang. Cambodia, mo pi choi American, khmer UMC Long Beach. Thay ni ao kun pong. Kiem mien ai gset khong ca an prea mentu prea. Prea lo thom prea to lo sam ram chi bet chieng. Thay ni kiem som an nu gom pi ma thai. Chum puk dap nam pel. ปีคอมมวยตะคอปรามคนลองมอกประมวยทั้งไงเปรียบเยซูตรงโยกเปโตรจากกบนั่งอยู่หานจีบโอนจากกบตื่นชิมมวยนั่งตรงก็น้อม
and for God's salvation, love, hope, and comfort that I found in Jesus Christ. So let us all go into the presence of our gracious and loving God. Eternal God, we praise you for the great company of all of those who have finished their course in faith and now rest from their labor. We praise you for those who are dear to us, whom we name in our hearts before you. Let perpetual light shine upon them and let us, by allowing their memories to nourish us for our courses and faith still before us. Above all else, remind us that your love never ends. We praise you for home and friends and for our baptism and place in your church with all who have lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake and who lives and prays for each of us. Jesus was nourished by the, mo by the memory of those who came before in the mountaintop meetings with Moses and Elijah. Let us also be nourished by the memory of those who have come before us. We pray to you for one another in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. For those who are weak, give strength. To all who have sinned, mercy. To all who sorrow, your peace. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another, and in all our ways, we trust you. And to you, with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, in our service this morning, we will both remember those who have passed and celebrate in baptism. And in these two sacred practices, we are invited to find nourishment. In both, we will use the element, the, element, the ordinary element of water. And so we reflect, let us enter into a space of wonder through poetry. Wonder about the ways water connects all of us through time and space. An Anthology of Rain by Phyllis Levin. For this you may see no need. You may think my aim dead set on something devoid of conceivable value. An Anthology of Rain. A collection of voices telling someone somewhere what it means to follow a drop, traveling to its final place of rest. But do consider this request if you have pressed your nose of any shape against a window. Odor of metal faint, persistent, while a storm cast its cloak over the shoulder of every cloud in sight. You are free to say whatever crosses your mind when you look at the face of time in the passing of one drop, chasing another, gathering speed, racing to reach a fork in the path, lingering before making a detour to join another, fattening on the way until entering a rivulet running to the sill. So please, accept this invitation. You are welcome to submit. There is no limit to its limit. Even the instructions are a breeze. As long as you include nothing about yourself except your name, your address remains unnecessary, for the rain will find you. If you receive it, it receives you. Whether or not you contribute, a volume is sent. And when you lift the collection, you may hear, 
by opening anywhere, a drop, and its story reappear as air turns to water, water to air. <laughs> and now we will remember those members of the clergy and their spouses of the California Pacific Annual Conference who have passed away this year. A quick note on our video, uh, we have one date wrong, and so just wanted to clarify that, that Harry Pack's birthday is January 4th, 1934. The Lord abide in his shadow for life. Say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock in whom I trust and I will raise you up on eagle's wings bear you on the breath of dawn make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand let's sing the snare the snare of the tower will never capture you Famine will bring you no fear Under his wings your refuge Is faithfulness your shield And he will raise you up on eagle's wings Bear you on the breath of dawn Make you to shine like the sun And hold you in the palm you need not fear the terror of the night the arrow that flies by day thousands fall around you fear you it shall not come let's sing this he will raise you up on eagle's wings bear you on the breath Make you to shine like the sun And hold you in the palm of his hand For his angels he's given a command To guard you in all of your ways Upon their hands they will bear you up As you dash your foot against a stone you up on eagle's wings, bear you on the breath of dawn, make you to shine like the sun, and hold you in the palm of his hand, and hold you, and hold you in the palm of his hand.
angels he's given the command to guard you in all of your ways under the hands they will bear you up to touch foot against the storm and he will raise you up on eagles wings bear you on the breath of dawn make you to shine like the sun and hold you in the palm of his hand and hold you and hold you in the palm of his hand good morning i am deborah bass Crossroads United Methodist Church and chairperson of Strengthening the Black Church for the 21st Century. Good morning, I'm Michael Mitchell, a South District Lay Leader, a conference uh, New Ministries EMT. We invite you to a libation ceremony. The practice of pouring libations in African American culture draws inspiration from African traditions, specifically those that were brought over during the transatlantic slave trade. Pouring libation, however, is a practice shared by many indigenous cultures. This ritual often performed at significant events, gatherings and ceremonies serves as a way to honor the lives of those who have joined the chorus of heaven and to maintain a connection with our historical cultural and relational past. Libations are traditionally performed by pouring a liquid, generally water, into a sacred container or on the earth. The act of pouring is symbolic, representing the pouring out of gratitude, respect, and blessings to those who have come before. We, the people of the African diaspora, welcome you to join with us in the time of reverence and remembrance as we pour libation for all those who have joined the great cloud of witnesses this year. After each time we pour, we invite you to re respond with Ashe. Repeat after me, Ashe. Ashe. Which is a Swahili word conveying spiritual power, affirmation, and an acknowledgement of the presence of God let us pray. Eternal and everlasting God, the one who nourishes us with water, declaring that you will make rivers flow on bare mountain, mountaintops, springs flow through rip valleys, turn deserts into lakes, and turn dry land into springs. We give you thanks for the gift of water. We are grateful for the cleansing, renewing, replenishing, and restoring power of water. We repent of our misuse of this gift, recognizing that human actions fueled by greed and overconsumption have resulted in millions around the world not having access to clean water. We bless the courageous efforts of indigenous people in every land and their allies who fight to protect this precious gift every day. Unite us, God, again with the divine flow of your spirit, present in water, as today we honor and celebrate the cycle of life. May this water be blessed to release those who have departed this life for life eternal and to welcome the little one whose life in Christ is just beginning. We pray this in the name of the one who is the living water, Jesus Christ, amen and ashe. We pour this libation to honor our foremothers and fathers, honoring the, their contributions to our lives. May their wisdom, strength, and love continue to flow through us. those whose lives have been taken by violence, war, oppression, and neglect. May we bring an end to gun violence, racism, police brutality, domestic abuse, LGBTQ violence, 
global war and bullying in our world. Ashe. May we recognize the departed freedom fighters, resistors, change makers, and champions for peace who made the world a better place. We honor their sacrifices and pray that their resilience now resides within us. Ashe. Ashe. We honor the clergy members of the Cal Pacific Annual Conference and their spouses who have passed away this year and are now resting in the arms of God. We give thanks for their lives, leadership, and witness, and we renew in their honor our commitment to serve faithfully in ministry as lay and clergy persons. Ashe. Ashe. We acknowledge and grieve the losses of people, places, circumstances over the past several years to COVID, unexpected changes in our churches, in our families, and in our lives. May this water bring refreshment and restoration for the journey ahead. Ashe. We now invite you to call out the name of one who you wish to honor with libations. Sp please speak their names now. These bowls now carry the love, courage, beauty, and faithfulness of all of the souls we have recognized today. This water connects the past and the present, the heavenly realms and the earth. This water is blessed, it is sacred, and is now ready to support Shea Cameron Robert Donaldson who will be baptized today, his family, and all of us in our continued journey of faith. Let us say together, Ashe. Ashe. So today we are going to baptize Shay Cameron Robert Donaldson. He's got a sweet suit on today. <laughs> and we're, he's here with his parents, Katie and John Donaldson, his family, and some of his family have joined us online, and also his sister, Sam. Siblings in Christ, baptism is an outward and visible sign of a grace of the Lord Jesus Christ through which grace we become partakers in his righteousness and heirs of life eternal. Those receiving the sacrament are thereby marked as Christian disciples and initiated into the fellowship of Christ's holy church, experienced by us gathered here and now, as well as the great cloud of witnesses who have come before. Our Lord has expressly given to the little children a place among the people of God which holy privilege must not be denied them. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, let the little children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. I present to you, Shay Cameron Robert for baptism. <laughs> I see. Beloved, do you in presenting this child for holy baptism Confess your faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If so, say, I do. I do. do you reject all that is evil, repent of your sin, 
and accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. If so, say, I do. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ is open to people of all ages, nations, and races? If so, say, I do. And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church, that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. I will. And to you, the people of the conference, I ask these questions. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? If so, say, we will. We will. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Eternal creator, your mighty acts of salvation have been made known through water. From the moving of your spirit upon the waters of creation to the deliverance of your people through the flood and the Red Sea, in the fullness of time you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb, baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. On the mountaintop, he was reminded of his baptism through the words spoken over him, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection, tying us all together as members of Christ's church, forever called to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this child who receives it, to wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness through his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in his final victory through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. All praises to you, Eternal Father, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with you and the Holy Spirit, lives and reigns forever. Amen. Shay Cameron Robert, I baptize you. It's kind of cold. In the name of the Father. Hi, sweetie. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You want to put your hands on him with me? Come and put, lay your hands on him. The Holy Spirit work within you, Shay, that being born through the water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. It is our joy to welcome you, our new sibling in Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes. Through baptism, you are incorporated into Christ's Holy Spirit, into the God's new creation, and made to share in Christ's holy priesthood. We are all one in Christ Jesus us gathered here in the great cloud of witnesses. On their behalf and ours, we welcome you. Members of the household of God, I commend Shay to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, to confirm his hope, and to perfect him in love. The God of all grace, who has called us to eternal glory in Christ, establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you may live in grace and peace. We're going to come down and show Shay off a little bit. So. <laughs>
Let's give one more round of applause. <laughs> In baptism, we experience both beginnings and endings. On the mountain, Jesus was met by members of the great cloud of witnesses, Moses and Elijah. In the midst of that moment, was reminded of his own baptism, his own beginning. It is only fitting that in this time to be nourished by memory, we are reminded of the cycles of life and death that baptism speaks to so beautifully. So we remember those who have come before us. We remember our own beginnings and endings through our own baptisms. After the service added to our front table will be these bowls of water. And throughout the rest of your time at this annual conference, we invite you to come forward to dip your hands in the waters and be nourished by the memory of your own baptism and all those who have come before and of the Holy Spirit who lives within each and every one of you. If you are joining us on Zoom, you are invited to find some water at home. Find a vessel that you can use to join in this practice as well. Let us go from this space being nourished by memory as you remember the cycle of life, those who have come before, and those who will follow us. And now if you would stand as the band leads us in our closing song, Be Still My Soul. So the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leap to your God.
has sold for us. I mean, for us. Has welcomed you. Ministry is about sharing that divine hospitality with each other and with the stranger. I felt like a stranger when I wandered into Southern California from the San Joaquin Valley farmlands. But I'm glad for those who journeyed with me to ordination, including friends at Claremont School of Theology, Wesley United Methodist Church in Riverside, and Santa Clarita United Methodist Church. I was ordained a deacon in 93 and an elder in 1997. In 1993, Baldwin Park United Methodist welcomed me as their pastor. I had helped to bring stability to this congregation after their sanctuary had just been reconstructed due to dry rot and termites. Now, since my wife, Chin Shek, was pastor at the, at the, the Chinese ministry at Alhambra First United Methodist Church, we sometimes used our Temple City home for joint fellowship. By the time I left in 2001, Baldwin Park was welcoming our Hispanic neighbors with the Spanish language ministry. In 2001, we joined the General Board of Global Ministries family. Singapore became our new missionary home right after Christmas that year. I felt like a stranger again, but I was welcomed by the staff in the Bishop's Office of the Methodist Church of Singapore, where I served as chaplain with the headquarters staff and with the Methodist students at Trinity Theological College, where my wife was teaching. I also coordinated general conference events, including their Aldersgate Convention, as well as writing for its publications and website. In 2010, after beginning the DMIN degree at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, I believe our Chinese Methodist Church welcomed me as the Ang Mo, or white pastor, for an English-speaking ministry. Now, English is the minority language for that 1,500-member Chinese-speaking church. I'm very grateful for the hospitality of all our Singapore hosts, because those were some of the richest experiences in my life. When we returned stateside in 2016, I felt like a stranger again. I was conferred the D-Men degree with my dissertation, a place from the stranger, worship as a spiritual practice of hospitality. I was then welcomed as the Akaji, or white master of the sea.
Good morning, CalPAC. Good morning, CalPAC. The Lord be with you. Okay, let's do that again. The Lord be with you. There you go. I know we are technically six minutes before plenary begins, but we are short on time, so we are going to run a couple of the, the uh, retirement videos. So I invite you to please settle in, stand up, walk around, but please let's do so in a silent fashion. If I can have all your attention. Can you hear me? Good morning. There we go. If I can have some silence in the room, I would like to make an announcement. Close, getting there. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. You guys are excellent and you know what? Even ahead of the game. I know it is not nine o'clock yet, but we are so short on time. We're gonna run a couple of the retirement videos so you can enjoy them during our gathering. And so if I can have some silence in here, even though it isn't quite nine o'clock yet or 10 o'clock yet, I appreciate that. Thank you. Good morning, or good afternoon, depends on when you're seeing this video. Uh, my name is Dave Conrad, and I'm about to retire. Uh, most of you probably don't know me because I've been in churches that have been on the outskirts. I started in the Victorville Church, and that's when I got the call to ministry. Kind of surprised me as well as everybody else, but I guess God knew what he was doing. So I went through the ordination process and uh, was ordained and uh, was sent to Brawley and was there for about eight years. I uh, also went to uh, Trona and Annual Current as a two-point charge, and then eventually ended up in Wrightwood, where I've been here for about 16 years. So uh, along the way, I've had a lot of wonderful people that I've been blessed with, and so I guess God knew what he was doing. And I just want to say thanks to all the people who've helped me out, the uh, administrative boards, the music staff, um, the congregation. Uh, they really supported me. Uh, I could thank him uh, all day long, and there's too many people, but uh, they know because I've always... Uh, told them thanks. And uh, up on the pulpit here, there's a, a, a turtle. And everybody else always asks me, uh, what's a turtle for? And I said, well, if you see a turtle on a pulpit, you have to know that somebody had to help them get up there. So I've always blessed the people who've helped me and just been appreciative of that. But uh, there's two things that I want to do. I want to um, say thanks to two people in particular. One is Jesus Christ. Uh, he saved me, um, he changed me, he blessed me, he called me into ministry, and he's been with me every step of the way. And I just want to praise God for the opportunity to be able to preach the, the gospel. Uh, the Methodist Church ordained me and gave me a pulpit, and for all these years I've been faithful to uh, lift up the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm so thankful for the atoning work of, of the cross for me and everyone who receives him. So I appreciate God and, and Jesus Christ. He's my Lord, my Savior, and my best friend. Um, I also have another best friend, and I want to thank that person too. That's my wife, Susan. Uh, she's been with me the whole time. She's uh, heard all my sermons, Bible studies, uh, Christmas cantatas, Easter programs, sunrise services at uh, 38 degrees up here in, uh, in the mountains, and she's been there faithfully, cleaning the church and doing everything. Um, she's been with me the whole time. Um, she's heard so many sermons, Bible studies. Uh, she's now come to the point that she'll tell me, Dave, uh, you've told that joke about 10 times, you need to get uh, a new joke or a new church. But uh, now it's time to retire. And so I just want to let you know that uh, if you want to find me, you'll find me in one of two places. I'll be on the golf course. I have more time to play golf, and I'm really going to look forward to enjoying that. Uh, I can play golf almost every day except Sunday. Sunday is still the Lord's Day. And on Sunday, I'm going to be in a place where I haven't been for a long time. That's on the third pew, right-hand side, next to my wife. And so for the first time, I'm going to enjoy worshiping Jesus with her. So um, I'm off to the golf course, and I just want to hope that God has blessed you and that you've given him praise and glory and honor and put a smile on his face. Amen. Praise God.
Hi, I'm Katie Coots, and I am the last of four generations of pastors serving in this annual conference. In 1896, my great-grandfather heard a call to ordain ministry. He took correspondence courses and served as a local pastor in Alabama, and then becoming a clergy member of the Texas Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church South in 1900. He ended up here in California in 1919. Here he is in a photo with my dad and with Bishop Baker when my dad was ordained in 1950. Meanwhile, on my mother's side, my grandfather heard a call to ministry and became a member of this annual conference in 1917. He was a chaplain in World War I. Here is a poster of him as he served as a traveling evangelist. My dad heard a call to ministry while serving in the military during World War II and he thought the greatest way to make a difference in the world and to advocate for peace in the world was through the pulpit. His grandfather also used to give him a dime when he was a child, every time he said he wanted to be a Methodist pastor when he grew up, but that may have had nothing to do with him. My dad was also shaped by my papa, my mom's dad, who was passionate about peace, leading the conference peace committee, and also about racial justice. In my generation, my brother was also a clergy member of this annual conference, but later heard God calling him in a different direction. I heard my call to ordain ministry while at camp. I heard God say, I have plans for you. And I still don't know if I fulfilled those plans, but I've served 40 years, my dad served 42, and all told, my family has served for 170 appointment years. I have to hope we have done what God asked of us. We have had two traveling evangelists, two district superintendents, two chairs of conference archives, one council and ministries director, at least three teachers at Claremont School of Theology, and one staff member, one university senate member, one member of general board of discipleship, at least five general and jurisdictional delegates, and one jurisdictional secretary. We have served 26 churches as pastor. My family has also tended to organize things when organization was not in place. My mom, with minister's wives, which became clergy mates. Both my parents helped start charms. When I was a PK, I helped organize the preacher's kids into an organization. And when I was a young pastor before we had RIM, I knew there were gaps between what we learned in seminary and what we needed to know as local church pastors. So I organized my own program for young clergy. I could go on and on about what all my family has done and been involved with, but we only have three minutes. For the churches I've served, I sent you a thank you note. So I leave it here with love and gratitude. Good morning, church. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Thank you for admitting uh, our truths. So uh, before we begin today, uh, I would like to um, take a moment to, to do two things. First, uh, Reverend Ariel DePano requests prayers for Reverend Emilito Hernandez, who is a member of the CalPAC conference and has been in a coma for two weeks. Um, Ediel, are you in the room? I can't see. Yeah, he's yes, here. could you come to a mic and, and give us a prayer? I appreciate that. Mic one. Let us pray. Gracious God, we lift up Emilito during these moments of silence, knowing that you hold him in your hands. He has given his life to you in service. Be with him now in his hour of need and through all this, dear Lord, help his family keep faith in your promises of abundant life even through 
these excruciating moments of uncertainty. Let them feel your love and your abiding presence. And let them know that this family of the CalPAC Annual Conference is lifting them up in prayer, in thought, and in love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ediel. I also would like to just ask the staff members who have helped to make this conference happen behind the scenes, those who work in the office, uh, if you would stand and let us thank you. And I'd like to know if Margaret's in the room. Is she in the room? She's playing hooky? <laughs> okay, we'll speak to Margaret in a little bit. Um, it's her birthday, that's what I wanted you all to know. So I want you to uh, greet her when you, when you can. All right, we're gonna call this meeting to order. The, um, this session, on this day, where God is here among us, it, we, we, we will begin and call it to order. And now I'd ask for uh, Katie to come and give us the orders of the day. Good morning again, annual conference. I am Kathy Capp, and I am clergy serving University UMC in Irvine, and I am pleased and honored to be your agenda here today, your agenda chair here today. I invite you, while I do my announcements really quickly, to grab your phone because we will be voting to approve the orders of the day, and I want you to have some time to get into your vo voting portal. And I just want to say we've had so much amazing work done already yesterday. It wasn't yesterday great? <laughs> All right. We have so much wonderful work to be done, good work and celebration and honoring of the work that is being done. And we actually have more, more work to be done than we have time. And we tried an alternative method of getting some of our ministry videos done yesterday and we heard your feedback, we realized that did not work. So we're going to go ahead and, and continue to do it within the body of the plenary but I also ask for grace. We're Methodists. We should be steeped in God's grace. And so I ask for grace because we likely will not finish at the 12 o'clock mark. And so I also invite you to be prepared for the work that we are doing. And if you have any technical issues or questions, you can ask someone at the secretary's table instead of coming to the microphone, unless it's a, a point of order or something of that nature. And so we want to help everybody get their work done, but in a timely manner. I also am completely aware that sitting for an extended period of time does some not so happy things to our bodies. And there is plenty of room in the back and we invite you to stand up, stretch, go in the back or get up and leave the room for whatever needs you have during the session because we want you to be comfortable. And so please feel free to do that. Now, do you all have your phones ready? Yes. If so, Bishop, I move the order. Oh. The orders are here on the, on the board. And Bishop, I move the orders of the day. This motion is before you. You can pull out your devices and let's have a vote. When we see it on the screen, let's see. Okay, vote now. All right, you have approved. Excellent. Now, in, in the spirit of preparation, I would like to add one more slide for you, and that will be the order of legislation that will take place 
in plenary four, which is this afternoon, but this will allow you to, to prepare yourselves, make sure you have the, the uh, resolutions and the rules and the recommendations downloaded to your devices ahead of time so that we can move very quickly. So those orders, uh, the order of the legislation should, if we can get that up there. And then grab your phones and take a picture of it. That way you can look at it for later. This will be in our 2 o'clock plenary this afternoon. It is plenary 4. And these are the items of legislation that we will be bringing before you at that time. All right. Thank you very much. All right. I call Juan Suck up to, the, to give us some announcements. I want to make a confession about Juan. The first time I met him, he, uh, I was in Hawaii, and he said, hi, my name is Juan. And I don't know if he said Suk, but I heard Juan. And I thought, wow, J-U-A-N, how cool. <laughs> so. Bishop, I'll confess that I became naturalized. <laughs> okay. And I was thinking about changing my name officially to Juan. Yes. <laughs> but I don't speak Spanish. I learned okay. French. <laughs> Je parle en français. <laughs> but some of you can help me with that as we go along. Walt, Bishop, Cabinet, and our siblings of the CalPAC Annual Conference, aloha. Aloha. It's so good to be with you together. This morning, I want to start by thanking you all for the care that you have been sharing with one another. That as we have gathered and as we have moved, you have taken your trash. Thank you very much. I see you. And I also thank you for heeding our request for you to go out the side doors if you're going to the meals, not this away. So we appreciate that because it helps with the madness. Yesterday, you got some cards, right? The blank cards that we're sending over to Calexico. Now, some of you have been asking, can we take some extra cards? Yes, they are available in the back table where you'll see me sitting most of the time. You can take those cards, take them to your church, and fill them out. If you take them over there, though, you can mail it straight to Calexico yourself. We invite you to do that and invite your whole church as a community to be involved. Also, as you're going back to share uh, some time to rest, as uh, Reverend Kathy had shared, one of the things we're asking for you all is as you stretch, as you converse, and as you go around about your business, keep in mind that the noise carries. Now, please, laugh as loud as you need to. Greet each other with a holy kiss as you need. But keep in mind that as we do this business, some of us are a little hard of hearing already, me included, after years of band. Along with that, we're grateful for your patience with us. We understand that Wi-Fi has not been so great for all of us, yeah? How many of you have experienced some drops from not being able to vote, not being able to get onto the CapAC website over the week? Okay, well, I can tell you that it's on and off. It works sometimes, it doesn't work. Now, I hope the voting has been mostly smooth, and for many of you who've asked questions, you came to the back. Thank you for taking the invitation. And it's been the same thing. You'll notice, did you check the email that Jennifer Gaylord sent you on Monday? Did you click that same link? Is it not working? Can you press back? Can you reload? Wait a second, they haven't started the vote yet. All these questions are the same old, same old. Please, share in community, ask each other, as you've probably already been doing, help each other out as we navigate through this. Now, as much as it may be a little troublesome and hard to get onto the uh, calpacumc.org slash AC2023 website, some of you are wondering, well, what about all this legislation, especially the ones that have been updated? Well, Jennifer Gaylord has so lovingly, if you haven't noticed, posted some of them, printed them out over on a cork border on the side. So, if you feel like you can't trust the internet well enough in their consistency to get that, go over there, take pictures of all the legislation. That way you'll have it on your phone. Along with that, we have our nominations biographies. And please uh, have some patience with us as we have been gathering all of them as much as possible. It's a little imperfect, but we're working toward perfection, right? So, we have as many biographies as have been submitted so far. Please take a look at there, or go back on calpacumc.org slash AC2023. I want to remind you that, again, as we're voting, um, the nomination slate for delegates, we have also, uh, as a reminder, rules, 20, uh, rules 230203 and resolutions 2302, recommendations 2305, which has been updated, Recommendation 2306, which has been updated, and then recommendations, uh, recommendation 2307. 
Aside from that, for all other things, where is the website that we can go to? Say it with me. Calpacumc.org slash AC2023. I don't think I have a job anymore, Bishop. That's all I've got. Thank Mahalo. You. Thank you, Ansa. Our next order of business is a report from C Corps. Okay, before that happens, we're going to have a video. They can come up in the video. The Apostle admonishes us to welcome one another just as Christ has welcomed you. Ministry is about sharing that divine hospitality with each other and with the stranger. I felt like a stranger when I wandered into Southern California on the San Joaquin Valley farmlands. But I'm glad for those who journeyed with me toward a nation, including friends at Claremont School of Theology, Wesley United Methodist Church in Riverside, and Santa Clarita United Methodist Church. I was ordained a deacon in 93, and an elder in 1997. In 1993, Baldwin Park United Methodist Church welcomed me as their pastor. I helped to bring stability to this congregation after their sanctuary had just been reconstructed due to dry rot and termites. Now, since my wife, Chin Shek, was pastor at the, at the, the Chinese ministry at Alhambra First United Methodist Church, we sometimes used our Temple City home for joint fellowship. By the time I left in 2001, Baldwin Park was welcoming our Hispanic neighbors with a Spanish language ministry. In 2001, we joined the General Board of Global Ministries family. Singapore became our new missionary home right after Christmas that year. I felt like a stranger again, but I was welcomed by the staff in the Bishop's Office of the Methodist Church of Singapore where I served as chaplain with the headquarters staff and with the Methodist students at Trinity Theological College, where my wife was teaching. I also coordinated general conference events, including their Aldersgate Convention, as well as writing for its publications and website. In 2010, after beginning the D-Men degree at Pacific School of Religion in Berkeley, Pai Lai, our Chinese Methodist Church, welcomed me as the Ang Mo, or white pastor, for an English-speaking ministry. Now, English is the minority language for that 1,500-member Chinese-speaking church. But I'm very grateful for the hospitality of all our Singapore hosts, because those were some of the richest experiences in my life. When we returned stateside in 2016, I felt like a stranger again. I was conferred the D-Men degree with my dissertation, a place for the stranger, worship, as a spiritual practice of hospitality. I was then welcomed as the Akajin, or white pastor, of Sage Granada Park United Methodist Church, which was a merger of the Japanese American and Caucasian churches. This church has been known as a welcoming and inclusive community, making space for all people. It is a home for the Scouts, for a Pig Flag chapter, for a Gujarati church, for a Japanese language school, our own preschool, seniors playing ukulele, Alhambra Performing Arts Center, and others. I'm looking forward to new adventures in this shadow of the Sierra Nevada. But I'm also faced with a major health challenge, pulmonary fibrosis, that is ravishing my lungs. We're praying for God's provisions, including the possibility of a lung transplant I also pray that in retirement from the itinerant ministry, I may continue to share God's amazing hospitality. Welcome to Real Talk 
a conversation on religion and race. Good morning, my brothers and sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Dr. Larry Hyde Jr. and I am a layperson from Harmony Toluca Lake United Methodist Church, a campus of the Hollywood United Methodist Church where I serve on the leadership team at Harmony and the chair of our governance board at Hollywood. And in the spirit of Reverend Katie Coots, uh, I am a lifelong United Methodist and a fifth generation Methodist from slavery. My great great grandfather who migrated from Macon, Georgia to Or City, Texas after slavery was Methodist and a portion of our family uh, has been Methodist uh, to uh, this day. I had the privilege of serving as your conference communications director from 2002 to 2010, and now I'm a professor at California State University, Dominguez Hills, and get to teach what I did for a living for more than 20 years as a United Methodist communication. We are here this morning for real talk. Can you say real talk? Real talk. All right, real talk. This is a conversation series here at the 37th session of the California Pacific Annual Conference. The conversation this morning is about moving the conference's commitment to anti-racism forward. So we're trying to move our commitment to anti-racism forward this morning. And this is one of the five emphasis of our ending spiritual and physical hunger vision. And I'm going to ask our panelists before they speak this morning just to tell, uh, tell the congregation, those of us gathered, who you are. Uh, and we're going to again begin by a little background of the audit and what has happened since things began. And Lily is going to begin us this morning. I'm Lily Villaman, pastor and spiritual leader of Covina United Methodist Church in the city of Covina. Let me give you, Brother Larry and brothers and sisters, a narrative and synopsis of uh, how we started and what we have accomplished this year. In 2020, in response to the murder of George Floyd and following numerous marches in response to racial violence, our annual conference passed a resolution 20-06 called Strategic Plan for Racial Equity for our conference. And this was initially drafted, co-authored by Rachel Gibson and um, Pastor Mary uh, Mandy McDowell. And it addresses to develop and train black youth leadership throughout the annual conference through the work of camping ministries. This led to the reestablishment of CORE which is an acronym for Conference Commission on Religion and Race, in September 2020. The members of CORE share the passion for justice for black, indigenous, and people of color for all experiencing marginalization. Resolution 20-6 tasked the commission with a racial disparity audit of the conference. The commission worked with conference leadership to sign a $50,000 contract with Dr. Magela Bethune to conduct an audit from 2021 through the end of 2022. The audit includes one, quantitative and qualitative data analysis focusing on the work of the Board of Ordained Ministry, the Conference Board of Ordained Ministry. Two, the Council of Finance and Administration. And three, the Conference Cabinet. The analytical framework examines the historical equity informed in terms of identity and racial representation. Second um, uh, task that we were given with this audit is uh, to conduct listening sessions with emphasis on mental health. And I believe Dr. Chris Carter will say more about trauma. This uh, really examined the needs to systematically check, check how racial ethnic people experience marginalization. In the annual conference of 2021, a followed uh, resolution expanded the work of CORE and a resolution um, which presented a budget of $250,000 over the next five years. This was co-authored by the Reverend Sandy Richard 
and myself. This um, work of anti-racism uh, includes education, uh, completing the racial disparity audit, providing lay and clergy leadership development, such as what we've completed this past year, um, the Crossroads uh, workshop. In hiring all of the, um, that, way back, the resolution uh, was a collaborative work and it's passed 95% of the approval rate. And uh, the numerous caucuses groups join us in support. That's why we had that 95% approval. So this gives you a narrative of where we have been and we're hoping to you're going to hear more about recommendations later. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Reverend Kirsten Sung Kyo Oh. I am an ordained clergy in this annual conference, and I teach practical theology at Azusa Pacific University and also work as a liaison for United Methodist Churches at Fuller Theological Seminary. So as you could imagine, when that resolution passed with 95 percentile last year at the annual conference, we were elated and looked forward to the work before us. But let's be real. <laughs> um, first, we realized that racism in itself is, we all know, very complex and layered and the work of dismantling it within a system like the CalPAC and other institutions of any size are indeed challenging. There's even the myth that if we were to address something like racism, it would cause division. Yet we realize that instead of division, what it creates is discomfort. The truth is, if we don't address the issue and erroneous think that silence is golden, the lack of speaking the truth will perpetuate the division that already exists. In addition, although the commission members began with great gusto and passion, several members of the committee encountered urgent personal and professional matters that prevented the full participation in this work. That includes myself. My father went through some intensive health crises and recently died on Easter Sunday, which precluded me from working more, more uh, presently with this commission. These absences, coupled with internal communications among the members of the committee, the cabinet, and other conference leadership, led to some fractured relationships and ongoing delays in our progress. But here's what we learned, even in the uh, midst of these challenges, that this is a very spiritually intense, emotionally and physically exhausting work. Yet, it is important work that the mandate for racial justice is a gospel imperative. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen. And that it continues to captivate us. It continues to hearken us to listen and compels us to bring our hearts, our heads, and our hands together to do this work. So the audit has continued with eight community listening sessions and over 20 individual, uh, individual interviews led by our consultant, Dr. Miguela Bethune, and a compilation of conference stati statistical data um, by Jennifer Gaylord, our conference staff, taxed by this committee. Now, we may be discomforted by the results of the audit, and may I even add that I hope that we are discomforted by the results of the audit. And we have to ask this very intentional spiritual direction question. That is, what is God revealing to us through this audit? And secondly, how do we faithfully walk with God to address what is revealed through this audit? 
Larry. Oh. Larry, so one thing I wanted to, I wanted okay. to add before we uh, move on. Uh, so my name is Reverend Dr. Christopher Carter. I am currently at Westwood United Methodist Church as the associate pastor. I have needless right now. So as those of you who know me know, that's just how I roll. Um, one thing I wanted to say about the history and, and how we got here with respect to the um, folks who have served on core, who've had to step down for lots of reasons, is just for us to recognize how not only emotionally taxing this work is, but the ways in which this work is often presented and given to people of color that already are burdened with lots of other jobs, lots of other things we have to do, and how this leads to a particular kind of can lead to particular kinds of burnout, exhaustion, and frustration. And so it's, it's so crucial for us to do this work from a particular kind of posture, right? Because more often than not, you know, you can lean into this justice-oriented work from a posture of anger, a, a posture of what might believe to be righteous anger. Um, but ultimately, that anger will consume you that will burn you up and burn you out. And so the posture with which we are trying to do this work, I would argue, comes from a place of compassion, and that is the only place it can be sustainable. And at the same time, as, as Kirsten said, I will, I, I will guarantee you the data that we have already seen is going to make you uncomfortable, but it's not anything that any of us should be surprised of. Right? If you have a relationship with a clergy person or a lay person that is a person of color that, attend, that goes to one of these churches or works at one of these churches, you know. You know what's happening. So now we're just giving you evidence so that you can see how things are. But I, I want to just name that uh, you know, this is emotionally taxing and difficult work, and it required us to really um, dig deep. And, 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 and I think we are still in a process of growing with respect to that. Um, and so I, I want to thank all of those who are here in the room who have served on CCOR um, at one point or another uh, in this current iteration, uh, because without their work, um, we wouldn't be able to be where we are right now. Uh, and so um, I want to invite you all to please, uh, stand up. yeah, to stand up if you're here. So I'm looking at Jessica and Sue Ann, especially folks that have... Pula. Pula. I know Pula's probably running somewhere. It's so please give a round of applause. All right, y'all ready for some real talk? Say real talk. All right, Dr. Bethune is going to uh, tell us about some of the findings and then we'll explore them one by one. Good morning, e Caro. Uh, my name is Dr. Michaela Bethune. Uh, it, is, it is a distinct pleasure, really and truly, to be back in this place with so many of my comrades uh, here on stage, here out in the audience. I echo the sentimentality of, of Dr. Carter here. I'm, I'm grateful for this work that we have achieved together. Um, all of the comrades who were either previous or current members of CCOR who have worked uh, to support the work that I've tried to do in this racial equity audit. So I just want to very briefly kind of talk about how um, we arrived at the themes that will be presented today. Um, I have a sort of different situation when it comes to uh, producing a set of, of, of themes. For me, as the, the lead consultant for the racial equity audit, my commitment was to a, a set of insights that are data-driven. And so early on in this project, when I was presented with the scope of the racial equity audit uh, that, was, uh, that was sort of uh, described in the resolution, it was important to me to broaden the framework, okay? The word audit sort of implies a fixation or a centering of numbers, of sort of descriptive statistics uh, that, that attempt to describe um, a, a, the depth and breadth of experience. And so one of the first things that I uh, presented in, in my proposal was a broadening of the scope of the work, not only to include a sort of a systematic audit of existing data, but also to have an equity-oriented frame whereby we engage in uh, centering the community voice, the voices of people who are impacted. So we broaden the scope. Of, of analysis to include community listening sessions. But this was something that came about because of initial work, which I presented at the, the previous annual conference, where we did systematic uh, institutional assessment and environmental scan. That's where we created a set of preliminary themes 
prevalent themes out of your narratives, out of your stories, that help me to think about how better to drill down uh, and, and gain some insight to the variety of experiences of people who are impacted by racism in the conference and in the world. Yes? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, so um, that, that is a little bit about the methodology. So having those uh, preliminary themes, I then was sort of tasked to drill down in a way that was very intersectional to try to get some insight. So we had a series of eight community listening sessions that followed over 50 one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, and in those listening sessions, we met with folk who are a part of the black community. Uh, I traveled to Waikiki, to the Pacific Islanders Caucus, and met with folks who are Pacific Islanders, Tongan, Fijian, Samoan. Um, I met with folks at Native American UMC, um, the, the UMC church by name, but, but that doesn't have a Native American designation in this annual conference. Uh, I met with folks who are Spanish speaking, uh, Hispanic and Latinx folks as a part of this series. And what we're gonna be talking about today is not the exhaustive list of themes. There is a comprehensive report that is forthcoming now that we are drilling deeper into the existing data. What we're presenting today are cross-cutting themes, themes that have implications for all of us across the conference, admittedly, the themes that we're presenting today are clergy focused, but we need to think and talk about how the sort of downstream impacts of things that impact clergy, patterns that we see among clergy that we know echo uh, in laity and in the, the communities that we are outreaching to. So that's gonna be the subject of our conversation today. Really quick, the themes that we'll talk about. Number one, the complexities and challenges of cross-racial and cross-cultural appointments. Anybody, anybody know a little bit about Oh, okay, so I'm not making that one up. All right, the second theme that we'll talk about are, are some of the uh, disparities that we see in clergy salary at intersections of race, ethnicity, and gender. Finally, uh, we'll talk about uh, the administration and awarding of congressional, sorry, congregational uh, grants. And then lastly, we'll talk about ongoing trauma, the true spirit of what gets in between church and us and Jesus Christ, actually. So that'll be uh, how, we, how we wrap up today. All right, Let's thank you. dive right in. Let's get into it. The first theme is disparities in the appointment, appointment system with real concerns about cross-racial, cross-cultural appointments. And first, I want to give just an explanation of what a cross-racial, cross-cultural appointment is for those of us who might not know. Uh, and then we'll talk about what did we find in this area. OK, let me read straight from the discipline how it defines cross-racial, cross-cultural appointment. It is a um, paragraph. Let me turn to that. Do you just carry that around, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. <laughs> Let me read. Cross-racial and cross-cultural appointments are made as a creative response to increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the church and its leadership. Cross-racial and cross-cultural appointments are appointments of clergy persons, but let me say also uh, pastors, deacons, and local pastors. That should be included, right? Clergy persons to congregation in which the majority of their constituents are different from the clergy person's own racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds. Annual conferences shall prepare clergy and congregation for racial, cross-racial, and cross-cultural appointments. When such appointments are made, bishop, cabinets, and the conference boards of ordained ministry shall provide, shall provide, and let me underscore, specific trainings for the clergy persons so appointed and for their congregations. So Dr. Bethune, what were some of the findings in that area? Well, well here's what's interesting, here we go. Uh, real talk, uh, the data, there, there isn't an intentionally uh, constructed and structured database that is going to be public, publicly accessible or that I have um, just, just had access to that really uh, qualitatively and comprehensively 
yields an understanding of how cross-racial and cross-cultural appointments are decided upon, how ultimately they are implemented, what are the reasons and seasons um, they, they might be applied. And so, uh, you know, we, we, I have had to triangulate a, a set of insights from the existing data, looking at the sort of changing demographics of congregations. Uh, when we say majority, there's a CF, uh, or C, sorry, uh, conference finance and administration uh, sort of formulaic application where if a, a congregation is 70% or higher, one particular race or ethnicity, then it, it gives a sort of racial ethnic designation. Um, even when a church falls below that threshold of 70%, oftentimes congregations are still majority one race or ethnicity over another, or one or two over many others. So we really have to think about what we mean when we say multicultural churches, multiracial churches, cross-racial appointed churches. Um, there are multiple configurations of leadership, as, as Pastor Lilly described just now, um, whereby uh, sort of moving into a cross-racial space or multiracial space um, often still means that a congregation is white-led. It often means, anecdotally, what we've learned in, in community listening sessions, it often means that the person who may be a person of color uh, in an appointment still reflects the institutional practices, governance structures, and ways of fellowship and worship that mimic or that are adjacent to a sort of Eurocentric frame. Oh, I was just listening to see if I'm making stuff up again. <laughs> so with that being said, that's not something that we're going to find in, in, a, in a numerical data set. Okay. That was one of the important reasons why we engaged in a community listening session structure, an equity-oriented approach, in order to elicit some of those stories and to see uh, or to inform an analytic approach, for example, that, that made me look to see at the appointment of a cross-racial uh, clergy person, or a clergy person in a, in a cross-racial, cross-ethnic dynamic, and then to see, given one or two years out, if the ethnic demographics of that church shifted to match the new clergy person, to see if that church was discontinued or merged with another congregation within one or two years. And so those are some of the insights that I'm, I'm, I'm having to triangulate. But one of my recommendations is that there be an intentional uh, data set, a database that's created that qualitatively helps us understand these dynamics, the reasons, the outcomes, and the implications for, for clergy and for laity as well. And I'm gonna invite the queen of all data, Jennifer Gaylord, <laughs> to give us some further context. We, we can draw some conclusions from the data that exists now. Um, it's in the current composition of the conference, for instance, there are only a few churches in each category uh, that are defined as black or uh, Pacific Islander or S Hispanic. Um, and for a clergy person of one of these backgrounds, that means that the opportunities for them to work within their own communities are actually very limited, often in a specific geographic area. So for example, there are only 15 churches which are defined by the GCFA guideline as black currently in this conference. Uh, so for a black clergy person who wants to work within their community, that means that the cabinet only has a, 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 a population of 15 locations where they can uh, send this clergy person or they have to give them a cross-racial or cross-cultural appointment, and that can be a, a, a harder, a more difficult ministry field, right? And uh, so, <clears throat> um, so if you're wondering about what it means to understand systemic racism in this conference, that is just one, uh, one context. A, a white pastor, for instance, the cabinet has an option of 131 churches as opposed to 15. So there's a, a very broad, uh, a, there's a, a, a much broader opportunity for, uh, for pastors who are white to be appointed to a church that is not cross-racial or cross-cultural in nature. I'm gonna invite my brother Anthony to reflect on that. 
my voice will be much stronger after Saturday morning. <laughs> um, I'm Dr. Anthony Boger, and I'm the pastor of New Beginnings United Methodist Church in San Bernardino. Um, as you know, I have served in a number of different ministry contexts, but each and every one of them have been in the area of cross-cultural or cross-racial uh, appointments. Uh, when I was preparing for ministry and seminary and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached into all the world, that I didn't know at the time that I was supposed to be preparing to preach only to the black world or to one particular ethnicity or group, you know, in the world. But I was taking it literally that I was going to go and preach the gospel to the entire world. And so with intentionality, that has been my quest in ministry. And so I've been asked to uh, either share a story of the difficulty of cross-cultural, cross-racial appointments. And let me first begin that the question arises, um, can we actually have association without assimilation? You know, can we um, agree that we don't have to look alike or be alike in order to worship together or to share the same space or to come to the presence of God? Um, unfortunately, we find ourselves um, segregated based upon these things, as Martin Luther King told us that, you know, Sunday morning is the most segregated time in America. Um, and yet, my mother was a sharecropper in Mississippi. My grandmother was a sharecropper in Mississippi. My great-grandmother was the product of the Emancipation Proclamation. And a story, um, two years ago, I went down to Concord, North Carolina, the home of my father, and we thought we would find the slave cemetery for the Boger Slave Cemetery. And upon our arrival, we, we found the cemetery, which was on the property of the Boger Chapel United Methodist Church in Concord, North Carolina. I, I came back home and told the cabinet with excitement, I'm more Methodist than all of y'all. Okay. <laughs> You know, my, my four parents and, and the, the owners of, of my family were unfortunately Methodists. But the, <laughs> but, but the difficulty, quite honestly, um, in growing and working in a cross-racial appointment is our unwillingness to listen to each other's truth. Are we willing to not only listen not so that others may change so much, but that we learn to appreciate the journey that God has given to each one of us. Let me just add, Larry, that you know, we have cross-racial, but also, and cross-cultural, right? Cross-cultural can mean uh, generations, right? So for me, it's 1.5 generation being appointed to maybe immigrants right, of uh, Filipino-American descent, and where the values, schooling and values are different. And for my own experience, um, it was uh, my, all my schooling is here in the West, from elementary to high school to college to postgraduate school. And so the values and learnings are very different, and so that was very hard. Um, uh, and the other thing, first uh, cross-cultural can also mean first female, mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. racial ethnic, right? Or first um, racial um, LBGTQ. Right? I just wanted to clarify that. There we can go, ahead and go to the second. Okay, let's move to the second area, disparity in salary. And Dr. Bethune, start us off. What did you find here? Okay, wonderful. So, uh, well, not wonderful. Uh, so, uh, again, we find ourselves with, um, you know, ample data, 
but data that, that, that needs, uh, I guess, more nuance. Um, when we just looked at descriptive st 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 statistics, looking at the salaries of clergy folk, uh, we see instant racial and ethnic disparities. Um, but what we did not analyze at this point, because we just need a, a more robust data set, are some of the are upstream contributing factors to why these disparities exist. So when we just look at raw numbers, uh, I, I do actually want to take a moment and call out across any sort of analytic frame that I could have applied to try to do as much justice to this data, Pacific Islander clergy make standard deviations less than any other clergy uh, racial or ethnic subgroup in the conference. I cannot do any magic with the numbers to make that impact disappear. So that is a priority era, area that needs immediate attention. Now, some of the um, upstream factors uh, that we think are very plausible for why some of these disparities exist, which are also tied to um, uh, sort of institutional racist practices that may be historical or contemporary, include the fact that uh, there are many different clergy types. So there may be racial ethnic disparities in the type of clergy membership. For example, folks who are uh, elders or deacons as opposed to folks who are, are local pastors, folks who are full-time as opposed to part-time, folks who have had more years of service um, than folks who are newer, and then people who are in different geographic areas with different cost of living. So the actual sort of application and impact of salary is different for people who live in different areas. We know our folks who are out in the Hawaii district have an entirely different existence and way of applying salary and compensation than people who are on mainland. Um, so we don't have a sort of uh, uh, model that factors all of those things. We just are looking at racial and ethnic disparities. When we add one factor, which is gender, when we look at race, ethnic, and gender intersections, we actually get a, a more clear picture that there are disparities that exist. So sometimes when we just look at race and ethnicity, uh, the, the disparities are either over or underestimated. When we add gender to a model, immediately we, get, we begin to see that women lag men in almost every sing, single racial and ethnic group. Um, among the ethnic group, and then there are disparities uh, between or uh, among clergymen and clergywomen. There's not enough data on folks who are non-binary because this is a new construct in the last couple of years. And so uh, there needs to be a more intensive salary study that is done that takes into account some of these other contributing factors where there also are racial and ethnic disparities. So we're not pulling away from race and ethnicity being a contributing factor. We're saying that there are some, basically some interactions with other junctures of, of, of conference governance and functioning. And I know we're pushing up against time, so I wanna make sure we get through everything. So I wanna ask Reverend Lupita to reflect upon. Yeah. The only thing I want to just clarify, just to make sure we all understand what Dr. Prathun was saying, is not that non-binary is new as an actual category. It's a new category for us tracking, yes. right? Just a new category for us to track. And if anything, what we can say is that we need to begin tracking more and more data, as, as Jennifer can let us know more about. So, Lupita. Um, Pastor Lupita, and I'm serving at Barsdale United Methodist Church. Um, I'm one of the few Latino females that are serving in this conference, and I have to say that in my own experience, I don't know how many other ethnicities would accept uh, lower than 100% assignments, mm -hmm. but I have accepted not just, uh, I, I have experience being at a 75, 50, 25 um, assignments, and sometimes, uh, the salaries, you know, are really um, difficult because the, the churches that I have been assigned to have been really churches that are struggling financially. And they hardly can make our salary. I mean, I've been in churches where they, I hear them say, you're bleeding us with your salary, salary package, really. And, it, and it's true for those churches that don't have enough budgets. But it's, you know, I don't know how many others would accept these kinds of appointments mm -hmm. or these kinds of uh, salaries, you know. Um, but it, and, and even, um, I have to say this, I came to serve the church and our communities, not because of what was, I was gonna make. Mm -hmm. I had a career before I came into ministry. 
and I had a better salary <laughs> before I came into ministry, <laughs> right? But I decided to follow Christ and to do my job, you know, and not to care about provision, because I knew that the God that loves us all would provide, yes. right? Amen. And I trust that. But is it is true, as you look at the data, as I look at my, uh, my fellow, you know, pastors and, and all the uh, people of color in our conference, and I look at, at their salaries, the kind of appointments that they get, I really get frustrated. I do. And I think it's, it's not fair. They're, if we're talking about, you know, promoting justice. And I think justice has to start with us. Yes, that's right. With us. Right? If I may add, um, back in early 1900s, W.E. Du Bois, uh, professor of sociology, talked about double consciousness that folks who are people of color uh, carry what's called double consciousness in that we are conscious of ourselves, but we're also very conscious of what other people think of us. Um, but persons, who, uh, th but there are intersectionalities to that as well. And what we add to double consciousness is triple consciousness of be being females in predominantly male-dominated roles as clergy. And then on top of that, we also have situations of disability or di differently abled bodies, which adds fourth layer of that consciousness. Yes. So we have third and fourth consciousness. And so I think that we have to be conscious of those elements when we think about salary disparities as well. Yeah. Let's talk about the next thing that emerged, an equitable district and conference support for pastors and congregations of color through grants and loans lack of leadership opportunities and development. And we want to call on Jennifer to uh, lift up some of the numbers for us. Well, I just want to link this to salaries. We know that churches are limited in resources, right? So uh, that affects both the clergy salary package and it also, uh, it, al it also gives, the, the conference offers opportunities to correct that through different kinds of grant programs, particularly uh, equitable compensation grants, new ministry grants, and uh, vital presence grants. So we also know that, uh, that there's this old adage in our world that says to um, put your money where your mouth is or when you're doing research to follow your money and to look at where it's going. So we did that and we looked at those three groups of grants in the last seven years. Now, I will say that there are some notable conclusions about this, but also what we didn't look at is who didn't apply for loans or grants right, who did not apply. Um, of the people, of the 103 of those grant programs, of those 103 grants that were given in 2016 to 2022, only two Pacific Islander churches received grants for a total of 2% of the dispersed funds. Um, so that is a notable conclusion. Um, it, the, the other, um, Four grants went to, uh, for 8% went to Hispanic churches, and the rest was, uh, those are the two lowest categories. <laughs> um, what, we, what we don't know though is, is, is why the rest of the churches of color are not applying and how we can help them resource those, those funds and those opportunities better. And our fourth area that uh, was ongoing trauma and all of the other things pointed to the challenges that have been faced by clergy and congregations for decades. Uh, the generational impact is huge. It does speak to resilience, but it is uh, also, we know, stressful uh, and damaging. So uh, let's reflect now on that uh, so we make sure we get to the uh, ongoing trauma. Yeah, I, I think, so as a way to, I know we are, um, we're not, able, if we could, y'all can see all the notes we have up here, we're not able to cover everything because even as we begin to peel back the layers of our stories, um, you can sense it's palpable the way in which this, we've all been hurt by what's happened. Mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, 
you know, what I want to, I guess, share is that one of the, if I would argue, the best way for us to begin to think about um, race and racialization is from the perspective and approach of trauma, a trauma-informed approach. Um, what I have argued in my own uh, work and writing and, and, and the research that I do is that I think we could, it, it's best for us to see the application of race thinking as a traumatic um, action that impacts us all. White supremacy ultimately is a trauma to the entire biotic community. So if you're thinking about the impact on the environment or on human beings, you can look at white supremacy as a root cause of so much structural evil that we are trying to confront in this country. Now the idea of, oh yeah, please, please, please. So you understand what, what I mean when, I, when I'm saying this. For the, the idea of race to stick, white people had to give up their connections to their native lands from an identity perspective. So you can no longer be British, you can no longer be French, you can no longer uh, be Spanish, you can no longer be Italian. You had to first adopt an overarching identity that was white, that therefore disconnected you from the sense of self that you have from your own sense of personhood. This is a kind of trauma that allows one to dehumanize another because they are already distancing themselves or what they know to be true within themselves. For we might call the imago Dei, the spirit that is within them. For you to adopt this identity requires a delinking from your own personhood. And this allows the application of the identity of racial ethnic categories that we now call people of color onto others therefore leading to the kind of traumas that we see as the implication and application of those kind of designations that therefore have led to dehumanization often theologically underpinned. We must never forget that the genocide of indigenous communities was justified theologically. We must never forget that slavery was justified theologically, that segregation was and continues to be justified theologically. You only have to look and listen to what you hear the evangelical saying right now, what you see the Southern Baptists saying right now, the way they crow scripture to know they see this as a Christianizing mission. This comes from a traumatic understanding of the gospel, a colonial misinterpretation of the gospel. So what we have to do collectively is understand and begin to unearth the traumas and traumatic retentions that we carry, right? So that we can begin to turn inward and heal ourselves and put ourselves in position to have relationship with others because we can't be truly in relationship with another until we heal that internalized narrative that tells me as a black man that I am not worthy to be on this stage, that I'm not worthy to have a PhD, that I'm not worthy to be in the predominantly white church that I happen to be in right now. And the same narratives that have told white people that they are in the particular kind of spaces that they are in because they have earned this. So what I'm going to do, I know we're wrapped for time. I'm going to have Dr. Bethune give us some uh, wrap-up remarks. And then I know, Lupita, we have some recommendations. Uh, and then, uh, yes. Uh, I'm no preacher, so I don't know what I could say to come after. <laughs> Let me just start there. Um, but but I, I really kind of wanted to underscore some of these points, uh, you all. I was, I was called to this work to do an audit, and I hope that... Uh, when you all are presented with the insights, which I, I believe are some are forthcoming today and others when we, when we uh, present the full report, that you understand that we really broaden this work to the extent possible, uh, again, to center the community full voice. The recommendations that will come out of my report uh, as the auditor, again, are data-driven. Um, they have engaged the data that I have been presented and that we went out and extracted from you all as community. And then this commission will be tasked to present a, a, a set of recommendations that come from those insights and that come from the experience of uh, the combined experience of the folks on this stage and from all of you. And so the, the very 
worst outcome that could come from this work is for you all to receive a report, to take a look at it, and then this gets filed and archived away until somebody else in five years, like Dr. Bethune, comes and replicates the work and tells us what we already know. Okay, we don't, we don't do this work because we're asking the questions of, is this institution racist? Is it American? <laughs> oh, okay, yes, yeah. so and what, and then what? Um, the task before us is to take these insights and recommendations and produce some action. Okay, I can't leave this stage being a community-engaged, action-oriented research by, by letting folks feel like, okay, so we're just a little racist. Yay, we're CalPAC. CalPAC <laughs> boasts being one of the most multiracial, diverse conferences in the world. Listen, I'm from Georgia. That ain't the flex you think it is, because what are you doing with it? <laughs> if diversity it's just chronicling and documenting the extent to which you have a plurality of people from different backgrounds, perspectives, languages. We speak 20 languages. What are we speaking today? Where are the captions? Where's the translation in real time before people are going to have to vote in that legislation? I know that these are things that wonderful folks like Tom are working really, really hard to facilitate. So thank you all. I know the task, but y'all, I mean, in the everydayness of this work, when we step over human beings that know will either freeze at night or have heat stroke this summer, right? We, we have to activate these insights. We are talking to a community of us, but, but this isn't ministry in this room. Ain't we already saved, I reckon? <laughs> okay, what happens outside of here? So I just want to implore that something actionable comes that would infiltrate every congregation, every ministry, every piece of outreach, every step we take that is actually in discipleship of Christ, uh, that it be something that's informed by this work. Okay, I, punctuation. And I'm going to have, <laughs> yes. We have intentional actions, right? <laughs> intentional actions. So. I'm going to close us out with Reverend Lupita giving us uh, the recommendations, our action items. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Yes. A lot of work. And it has to be intentional. And it has to be strategically put up. So we have uh, four recommendations. Um, one of them is meet with the key leadership groups throughout the conference to address each of those four concerns that came out of this outing. Um, it, it, if we want to shift to a core, uh, that it has to happen. Then we, we want to also recommend a salary study, uh, a more um, in-depth in salary study, exhaustive, multi-layered, you know, uh, that will give us uh, more information on how we need to move forward, right? Um, we also want to recommend, it's, this is the third recommendation, to initiate, initiate an intentional process of healing throughout this conference, uh, whereby new relational bonds are formed, confessions, repentance, and uh, structural reparations are made, and spiritual liberation happens. And I think um, we have done some of those things before, but I don't think they have taken us anywhere. They have to be, they, it has to be a different way of doing this. And then the fourth one, and I think this is important, is uh, we're proposing to create a full funded position with a sufficient independence and authority um, to provide support and accountability for what we call investment, to invest intentionally, you know, in healing and restoration. I think that is very, very important. So these are kind of our first steps, because after this, we will have to walk more, yes. right? Walk the line. I, All right, that's, I will add that's, one more charge, quickly, very briefly, quickly, quickly, quickly. very briefly. Uh, not another annual conference where this conference can say that there is not a Native American designated church that doesn't recognize the members and the constituency served at Native American UMC. Not another yes. conference. And the second charge is not another loss of a black church. Out of 20 churches in 2010, only 15 remain. That's a 25% loss, a decline 
in black churches, so not another black congregation loss. That's just a personal charge uh, that I'm issuing. So hopefully that's something that can be uh, addressed as well and that will come out of the data-driven uh, recommendations as well. So thank you so much for that All right, that's real talk, y'all. Let us uh, praise God for the work of this committee. Okay, we have some work ahead of us, and we are committed to do the work we need to do. So I'd like to just take a moment right now and uh, pray. Would you pray with me? God, we know you created each and every one of us beautiful, worthy, competent, and, uh, and valued. And sometimes we humans uh, forget that. So teach us how to be perfect in love, not just by the warm fuzzies we have inside of us, but also by every action we take to create a just and equitable space. God, help us to be a conference that not only speaks out our transparent truth, but also that makes the needed changes. Walk alongside of us, give us boldness and courage to be truly your people. In Jesus we pray, amen. 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 Okay, our next, our next uh, moment is the, uh, the scholarship video. I believe it's a video. Incorporated in 1909, SAI Gardena Industrial School opened in 1913. More than 2,400 young men were housed, trained, educated, and cared for in a safe Christian environment. In the early 1970s, the school was closed due to regulatory and financial burdens. Today, SAI's mission of serving the Hispanic youth who strive for a better life through higher education continues. My name is Amy Quinones. I am from the First United Methodist Church of Huntington Park. I am currently its secretary and I help out with the audio and projection system. I first heard of SAI through Spanglish where I was part of the design team along with preacher Leah who encouraged me to apply. Winning the SAI scholarship meant a lot to me because at the time that I applied, I wasn't financially able to pay for more than one class. So winning the scholarship allowed me to pay for three classes, which got me closer to my goal of finishing within two years. SAI's partnership with Teleku and the David Lizarraga scholarship really helped me in that it provided Lots of workshops on how to manage stress, how to manage my time. It provided me with opportunities to network and meet other people within the field that I am trying to get into. I am grateful to SAI for its commitment to helping Hispanic students further their education. Now we have a report uh, coming up after this video on, re on uh, budget, so uh, thank you for your work on this and have at it. Again, Larry, hi. Uh, Harmony Toluca Lake United Methodist Church. Oh, there's a video, okay. We gonna watch a video first. And I am the president for
Well, I'll go ahead and I'll just go ahead and get us rolling. Uh, <laughs> welcome back. This is Real Talk 2. Real Talk, Real Talk. In this session, we will be talking about the challenges and opportunities before us as we create a budget uh, that reflects our values and that can support our collective ministry into the future. Uh, we have Arch McCary, our conference treasurer, uh, John Woodall, executive director of the CalPAC Foundation, uh, Denise Barnes, director of Justice and Compassion, Sandy Owine, South District DS, uh, C Corps member and GCFA board member, and Allison Mark, the co chair of the Leadership and Discipleship EMT and pastor of Faith UMC in Torrance. Please help me welcome them to the stage. Yesterday, we heard from three of our conference leaders who spoke in different ways to the conference vision of ending spiritual and physical hunger. Uh, first was our bishop who issued us a challenge. Then our lay leader, Meli Maka, responded by stressing uh, that a nourished church navigates, offers, unites, rests, and initiates. And then finally, uh, with our executive director of Connectional Ministries, Aaron Hawkins, who held a mirror up to show us who we already are and ways we are already living into the vision. And I want to start there with Reverend Sandy. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Larry. You know, yesterday we heard from uh, Aaron and through the videos from the annual you know, conference that in spite of all the challenges, in spite of the um, issues around uh, racial inequality, um, the realities of all the various injustices, we have congregations and ministries across the breadth of our annual conference that are doing amazing work. And we have to celebrate that you know, God is greater than our problems. Uh, God is greater than our roadblocks. And even in the midst of all the struggles, God has still been at work. And we say hallelujah to that because we know that in our places. And you have been channels of that work through your local congregations. Uh, I can speak most uh, to the South District. And just to give you a quick painting of that, you know, we have congregations that are actually um, have taken in 20 and 15 uh, members over the last this last sort of six months. That uh, place after place is finding a new vitality. Uh, large confirmation classes for the first time in many years, uh, beginning to connect with their communities in whole new ways. That things that they didn't do prior to uh, COVID that are really finding ways to connect and find partnerships with their, um, with their neighbors and creating new ministries out of that. Uh, we have congregations that are really beginning to rethink how they use property. Uh, Legacy Square at Santana, which I hope we're going to see a little bit about a little later today, is ready next week to dedicate their massive um, um, affordable housing project with sustainable housing for over 90 families uh, that we're going to dedicate on Wednesday this coming week. Imperial Beach uh, project is on its way and we're about ready to hopefully by next February be breaking ground on 50 plus units of sustainable housing for at-risk seniors. Nestor has redone their property and is also almost finished with construction for their senior housing project. So beginning to rethink how it is we leverage one of our biggest assets uh, in our property and to use it for God's work in new ways is an exciting thing. Then we have congregations that are doing that mission ministry work of coming alongside our migrants from our um, amazing work out in the Imperial Valley and particularly being led by Pastor Baldwin and the Clexico Church. We know of the amazing work being done in San Diego through the Christ Ministry Center uh, and that the work that they are doing there, the Good Shepherd Center and El Cajon. Uh, across the, the South District, people are doing actual ministries that literally are saving lives uh, by feeding, housing, welcoming, and supporting. So I am so grateful for that. But we know there are challenges. Coming out of COVID has raised the, the bar and the kinds of things we already were facing prior to COVID. Uh, questions of sustainabilities of, of congregations. Uh, and how we fund uh, the ministry and how uh, congregations are able to, to find ways to deal with their buildings and the expense sometimes that comes from uh, many of our buildings being old and having not had the resources to keep them up, which is underscored by the racial et ethnic audit, which we'll get to a little bit later in many places. Uh, we also are seeing increased, and I'll say this, conflict in our congregations. Um, the kind of stressors that everyone has gone on, um, the amount of uh, tension in congregations between each other, uh, between pastors and staff, between um, uh, congregations and community, uh, and it's beginning to take a wear on people in the ways in which uh, boundaries are being broken, uh, where um, 
the lack of uh, health and good mental uh, mental health and is is really um, we're seeing this more and more every place. Um, and then the issues, the real issues of sustainability, and particularly as we look at the questions of health care and housing for clergy. Um, many of those things become almost impossible for a, a local church to sustain anymore. Uh, for instance, with one congregation, with housing and health care alone, just those two things, we're looking at $80,000. Now, that's before anything else. Well, some of, some of our annual uh, smaller churches, that might be a half or three quarters of their entire budget, and they haven't even talked about salary, which means that they're then having to move to less than full-time appointments, uh, which tends to not be the way in which you can help to grow and, and outreach in a congregation. Uh, and that is doubled down again when we go into congregations that are smaller, uh, have less financial resources, which are often our immigrant congregations as well. And so it becomes this um, intertwined reality of struggle and um, hardship that we can look at, but we haven't yet figured out how we can do that together. Reverend Allison, as a co-chair of one of our EMTs and a pastor, what are you seeing, hearing out there? Well, uh, following DS Sandy, I, I feel like we also, uh, being a local church pastor, we do feel the, the tension, really, in, in our, many of our churches. Um, we have to figure out how do we adapt to welcoming new people and being inclusive and open, but then we still hold on to our, our traditions and things that, that we want to keep close to our hearts, and so we don't always want to be as open as we say we are. Um, but I think it's the either or that is killing us. I, I think that I've heard numerous stories from clergy who feel and they, they lament over you, losing younger people or families um, who do have financial resources but, or skill set resources and, and the energy to actually do ministry. I think that we, we feel that they're walking away because a lot of them don't see what they can get from local churches because they don't want to participate in business meetings or the politics of the church. I, I feel like um, it, it, it hurts us because they're good people that just want to worship and be spiritual and worship God. I celebrate, though, those churches that trust each other. I, I, I celebrate the churches and the, the people, the leaders who trust their pastors to make decisions that are outside of the box and to dream forward for the community because otherwise, if we keep on tending to ourselves and not in both ways, that might be the end of our churches. And, and I really think though that one of the reasons why we're struggling is because we're trying to maintain the status quo and we're not allowing a bigger vision to emerge. So I wonder if the same is true on some level with our own conference. That, that we say we want to do something and do something new, but we, are we really ready to invest in it? And, and then why can't we let go of the things that we know no longer serve us? So I yearn for our conference and for our churches in, in terms of both and. So can we find ways to both invest in something new and simultaneously maintain the best of what already exists? and then letting the rest go. So I wonder what that'll look like. As we talk about letting go, uh, get out your phones quickly, get out your phones quickly, and let's, uh, let's talk about it. Um, we're gonna do one or two words of what do we need to let go of? Is that a, <laughs> is it coming? Should okay. Should be a poll. I'm assuming we're doing a word cloud. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So uh, get out your phones. One, two words. What do we need to let go of? What do we need to let go of?
And as these pop up, I'm gonna ask Reverend John to reflect the big ones are uh, the status quo way, pride, fear, status quo, and old, old. Pride, okay. pride is a <laughs> Well, <laughs> my, my, my lenses aren't good enough to figure that out <laughs> what I see there. But I, I think the thing that probably stands out for me the most, Larry, is status quo. There's a hard conversation which needs to take place. And I think the way I frame this is when um, I was in the local church for 35 years before I went to the foundation staff. And Sandy and I were ordained at the same time as deacons back in 1985. And I have to say the prevailing wisdom at that time is we were going to be working on doing minor course corrections because the future was this glorious future that we, um, everybody assumed was going to be the case. And I think what we found over these years is that the minor course corrections started to become bigger and bigger and bigger to where we finally got to the point where we realized we don't even have the map anymore. And I think that's one of the realizations that for so many of us we've hit in ministry that we are no longer in a place where tinkering is going to be the solution. And we really need to start having the honest and important discussion that we cannot sustain who we are as a denomination and as an annual conference in the way and fashion we used to see it. And I guess the more important question is, is that something we even want to sustain, given who we are as God's people called to be in ministry in Southern California? Um, and what I have watched is we have a very difficult uh, time in being willing to let go and giving something up and giving it up to God and saying, it served us for a time but it's not what's going to serve us as we move ahead. And in the travels that I'm doing around the conference, in my work with the foundation, it is becoming so apparent. The rules of the game have changed, and tinkering is no longer going to get us there. So we are doing some great work all around the annual conference. We've uh, lifted up things that we'd like to let go. So uh, a new one, what are... One or two words, what do we need to keep? What do we keep? What do we keep? Go. And I'm ask, going to ask Rev. Denise to reflect on hope, love, grace, faith, trust, and Jesus uh, <laughs> above all things is the, what we well, need to keep. And I can do that in a minute and a half, right? <laughs> you know, all of that describes our local churches, yes. right? That's the thing mm -hmm. that we've got to keep hold of. But we, maybe we need to shift how we think about our local churches, changing them from places that are worship-centric to service centers and places of mission where we do service to a, a whole diversity of our community based on, on Matthew 25, right? Who's hungry? Who's naked? Who's thirsty? Who's cold? Right where we're at. 
and who else is working with them and how can we start working together? We've already got churches that are doing that. We're opening an LGBT service center right in the middle of Compton where we can help reunify um, homeless LGBT kids with their parents and provide them with all of the other services that are needed. And we're not doing that in one church. There's churches that are working together to create those ministries. So yes, we need to keep hold of them and we need to help start turning towards places of service where we worship, of course, but also that are centered around and becoming vibrant, busy places where stuff's happening every day of the week in service and love and faith, following the steps of Jesus in our community. And one of the things we need to do is talk about how we fund collectively and resource our shared ministry uh, together. And our sister Archon is going to help us understand. Thank you, Larry. Do we have the slides, please? Slide one. So first of all, I want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for giving generously through the apportionment that connects us all together and helps us to do the ministry within the CALPEC conference and around the world. And uh, you have been so generous and faithful in your giving, so thank you so much. And so I will begin with what is our first source of revenue? And that is apportionment giving, about $10 million roughly every year, annually. And then as we move down, it's the direct billing. You may relate to that. Those who receive the billing statement from our office, it's the pension billing that includes the CRISP DB, DC, and CPP and the health insurance for, it, it's a group policy, and um, that's about $3 million. Property and liabilities, $6 million, and that's the coverage for property valuing $1.8 billion. So, hallelujah to that. <laughs> and that's the group policy which the conference purchases, and um, you receive the direct billing from us. Then we have four camping sites. Their budget is 2.5 million. The other source of the revenue is drawdown from the investment, which is governed by boards, committees, and the staff. And it's about roughly sometimes it's 1.5 million. Then we also have reserve funds. They are also governed by boards and committees. And around three to 500,000 is what we use roughly during the year. So now let's move to slide number two and talk about the expenses. The expenses, it, we'll take just a cursory look at the expenses. The details are available in the reports that are provided um, in the preliminary report every year. This year we haven't provided yet because the budget will be approved in November. Uh, but prior to that, we will. The apportionment budget, the 10 million, 2.4 million of that goes to the general church. The jurisdiction, we are in the Western jurisdiction, so 76,000 is allocated to Western jurisdiction. The 7.6 million that stays within the annual conference is then used to pay for the operations of the five districts the um, connectional ministries, equitable compensation, insurance, mm, the audit expenses and salaries, of, salaries and benefits of all the staff members. I also want to make a note that GCFA, General Council on Finance and Administration, subsidizes Episcopal Area Office expenses by giving us a grant of about 80,000. Billings that we sent to the uh, local churches for all the items that were discussed earlier, such as the uh, Christ DB, DC, and Health, they, they, there is an administrative fee that offsets the operating expenses for the HR office. The investment drawdown, currently it is, there is no set amount. Um, it is governed by boards and committees. 
and also ruled by the investment guidelines. The reserve funds, they are used as needed. The next slide, please. For your benefit, we have prepared a pie chart that talks about what is funded by um, the revenue. So 39% of the total, um, and, and the budget roughly is, with, with the investment and all incorporated, is about annually 28 million, of which 39% is covered by apportionment. And then the rest are in there. Next slide, please. There have been questions about restricted funds. And this question comes to me from local churches and from the staff within the annual conference. So let's define what the restricted funds are. These funds are set aside for a particular purpose as a result of designated giving. They are permanently restricted to that purpose and cannot be used for other expenses. Restricted funds are created when a donor wants the money to go to, one, a specific program, or be utilized after a specific time or event. Donors alone can direct the use of these assets. Now, oftentimes, the board-designated funds are misconstrued as restricted funds, and that's not the case. So one has to be very careful. The restricted funds and the board-designated funds are different. Board-designated funds are actually designated by the board, and they could be used for that purpose or could be used for another purpose. It could be repurposed. Next slide, please. The top four facts that you should know about the conference's finances, well, by the grace of God, and I truly mean it, by the grace of God, conference is financially stable. We have uninterrupted positive cash flow. We, we are truly grateful to the Lord. Um, the, for, for a person in my position, I have to continuously think about how the expenses will be met because we do not get the apportionment and the billings revenue consistently. But our expenses, they do not wait for the apportionment or the uh, other revenue to come in. And so we have biweekly payroll, that's a large amount. We want our staff members to get paid. And that, that becomes my problem a little bit. I have to make sure that I have funds in the bank so that uh, the payroll is not stopped. And by God's grace, that has never been the case. Then there are other expenses, such as large billings for the health insurance. Every month we have to pay Kaiser on behalf of our local churches. We upfront that, and then we build the local churches. So that's another major expense. The, then the expense that follows is the property and liability insurance. That is another. They won't wait for me to receive the funds from the local churches. I have to make the payment right away, otherwise your policy will get canceled, and we do not want that to happen. So uh, positive cash flow, uninterrupted, cash flow, that's a good thing. And, and then, again, by God's grace and um, many thanks to my small team, we have received unqualified, which is a clean audit report since 2012. So I thank everyone. We are, we are grateful to Archina for that explanation and uh, briefly, uh, uh, for all of our panelists, one shift you would make as we think about how we move forward. Briefly. 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 Okay. I think we need to start prioritizing and resourcing and encouraging our lay people. And I, and I think that would be something that is, is a shift in, in a way that it's not, we're not saying that we wouldn't um, make 
our, our clergy pushed to the side, but we're saying that we want to empower and encourage them to develop the lay, lay people and laity. And so one of the things that uh, my co-chair and beloved friend, Melinda Dodge, who is sick this week, so please pray for her, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about what does it mean to develop laity and, and, and leadership. And so that would be a shift, I think, where we could say, and this is kind of huge, would be if we did this for the next decade and we put our focus on lay people. And what if we equip them with the values of the UMC, develop their leadership capabilities and abilities and their capacities, but also what if we had congregations have say 50 hours of training, congregational development work a year that they need to complete so that we can have strengthen both our clergy and lay people and congregations and community. So that might be a shift. Okay, Larry, you said this was real talk. Real talk. We need to change how we compensate clergy. Yes. Wait, wait till I tell you how. <laughs> <laughs> We have been set up on a corporate model, on a uh, capitalist model, forever, which has meant that clergy have been set in competition with each other to say that, well, if I do okay in this church, then my next church is going to get bigger, which means my paycheck is getting bigger. And so we have been intrinsically set up to not share with each other to not support each other because you know I got to get I want to support my family I want to you know increase the 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 ways in which I can live um, and we've had a ladder system which has meant that bigger churches have somehow been better churches and we all know that that's not true God is active in a small church rural church inner city church big church whatever kind of church it is God is still there and there's not bigger and better. But our system is set up so that it feels that way. So I actually want to suggest what I have been suggesting for almost 40 years now, <laughs> is that we would actually move to a system, I'm not sure the British Methodists still do it this way, but they used to, um, which is churches paid in to the conference and every single clergy person got the exact same salary. That salary increments for eight years of service and increments for family needs with children and so on. But what that allows, at least in theory, it wouldn't be perfect, is that you could then deploy clergy with their gifts in the places where they could actually serve. Experienced pastors could go into places that are struggling and needing some extra help and needing some extra support for the development of lay people uh, to face particular challenges. And you have younger or newer clergy that could be sent to larger churches and have experienced lay folks and that, that could help be a training ground for people. And we could begin to then actually do cross-racial and cross-cultural appointments um, that provide equity across the board because, again, our salary structure isn't as if I get to go to the big church, I get the best paycheck. Um, so that's my what we need to do. <laughs> to follow that. Um, one shift I really would like to see is to see the conference actually resourcing ministries on the ground with things they need, such as training and expertise to help them understand and make connections with people outside of the church who are doing similar work so we're not continuously reinventing the wheel every time we start a new ministry. And we need to invest in those methods and ideas that give us more, to get more of our people engaged in that ministry. If our work is mission-centered and not finance or system-centered, then we can truly live into our faith and trust that God will provide. Then this shift will not only be possible, but also life-giving, and not just to the people we, who we are doing service to, but to us who are doing the serving. The more we start operating in silos and start coming together amongst ourselves and with others doing similar work, then the more effective we will become. And a key component to all of that is understanding that there are people who look like each and every one of us in one way or another in all of the people that we serve. 
If we remember that, then that shift is easy to achieve. And we have to follow through with what we're doing. It's no use in us doing border ministries and helping our migrants get settled if we don't then work with them to make sure that they are fed, clothed, housed, and Amen. spiritually and physically fed. They have all that they need, fair wages, just housing. And then they can access further education and have a community on which they can rely, serve, and worship with. Amen. Larry, because my work so much involves resourcing, we United Methodists need to learn that it's okay to talk about money. We have a real problem talking about money because it's a taboo subject. But if we don't learn how to start talking about it, we're going to be in trouble. Last year, uh, in the data that's come out, religion was the largest part of the pie, uh, philanthropically across the country, it was responsible for 27% of all giving. The challenge, though, is that back in 1985, it was responsible for 56% of all charitable giving. So if you're wondering why we're stressed, since 1985, the amount of money that's gone to religion has decreased by 53%. Over that time, Americans have continued to give at about 2%. And that's considered to be one of the gener most generous giving rates in the world. And if we disaggregate church people, the dirty little secret is it only goes up to about 2.3 to 2.5 percent when we disaggregate church people. We are living in a time where there are plenty of resources. It's just what we're choosing to do with them. And what we haven't learned yet as the church is we are now in competition for every charitable dollar that's given because our people, our United Methodists, have started giving those charitable dollars elsewhere. And we need to start asking the question about why is that the case? I know that the future is going to involve learning how to put together multiple streams of revenue in order to finance ministry. And it can be done, we see it being done. Since 2021, our foundation has been able to respond to disbursement requests for your local churches and ministries in excess of $13.5 million because of your investments, $13.5 million have been injected back into the system. We have to comprehensively overhaul how we talk about financing ministry. Folks, the once a year annual campaign needs to be dead in the water. There needs to be a whole new way of how we go about doing this. And unfortunately, Larry, I could talk about this for hours, but ask me to come to your church and I'll be happy to do that. I'm going to give Sister Archer the final brief, right. uh, final brief. <laughs> final part. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> my, my fourth slide, which um, has the setting of missional priorities, and that is the key to projecting an effective budget. <clears throat> so, excuse me, I lost my voice somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, missional priorities, they are our top they should be the top. <clears throat> like uh, Denise said, finance is secondary. Mission is primary. And God is our provider. And we all serve the Lord. And so I will end with this. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. Colossians 3 and 17. Thank you. All right. God is our provider. We're going to have another budget discussion this uh, afternoon, uh, but we're going to take one more poll to help to inform that budget discussion uh, this afternoon in light of what we've hear, what we've been hearing this morning, what we've been discussing. Uh, we want to take one more poll, and we'll go into more in-depth this afternoon. Which of these statements most closely reflects where you are? Which of these statements... Uh, most closely reflects where you are. Number one, I believe that things in our congregation and conference are generally fine and we simply need to continue on in ministry as we always have. Number two, I believe with some minor adjustments, our present system can continue to support ministry on the congregational conference and denominational levels. Number three, 
I believe that the conference needs to consider plans for major restructuring of our financial, programmatic, and administrative structures and processes. Number four, I believe that the way we are structured and the way that we do things in our churches and conference is unsalvageable. We need to boldly re-envision what it means to be the church and to design new structures and processes from the ground up. And then number five, None of these statements quite captures where I am. More <laughs> conversation is needed. So select from the poll which of these statements most closely reflects where you are. Which of those five reflects most closely where you are? Go. So we see, I guess, C, uh, number three, uh, is where most people are, the majority. I believe that the conference needs to consider plans for major restructuring of our financial, programmatic, and administrative structures and uh, processes. And we'll delve uh, into more discussion about the budget and have more conversation uh, this afternoon. Let us praise God for our wonderful panelists this morning uh, who have helped us to explore. As they are leaving, and thank you so much for your hard work, um, we have someone who wants to speak. Do you still? Okay. Microphone two, please. Let us know who you are. Forgive me. I just feel strongly to share um, a couple of thoughts. I'm a tinkerer. Um, some people might think I'm more of a sledgehammer in my thoughts, but I wanted to just support what was being said by the clergy. Oh, forgive me, my name is Karen Kemmerer. I go to La Cunata United Methodist Church. I grew up in the Methodist Church. I've lived at Camp Colby. I've been on district groups and conference groups. I was part of the United Methodist Women leadership. I was the youth president at my own church. Um, I, I want to support what Allison said, that the status quo really needs to be questioned. And I believe, as she said, that we don't need to just make loyalty what the focus is. I think we need to include in laity both community members and church members. And I don't think that we need to get rid of the corporation structure. I think we need to get rid of the Wall Street corporation structure. There's a new class of businesses that's arising that is defining success and their worth as a company called B corporations. And they either include social um, income, environmental income, or um, how they're led income as part of their worth as a company. Wall Street does not define companies that way. It's purely financial. <laughs> um, I also think that 
we do need to think about how pastors are paid and how they're organized. I think we need to in develop diversity by having not pastors at a specific church, but having pastoral groups oversee a collection of churches. And maybe there are some church locations that would better serve as a community park with a playground. Maybe there are some churches that would better serve as low-income housing. Maybe there are some churches that would better serve as a coffee house, because that's where people gather these days. That's where people talk. And so my, my concern about restructuring is it implies keeping the current structure and adjusting it. <laughs> and I'm not anti-conference, I just, I've been disappointed that CalPAC conference leadership has not stood up to be a leader and to demonstrate Christ in leading the fight against um, LGBTQ discrimination, in leading the fight to combat climate change, in leading the fight to make sure that immigrants are welcomed when they cross the border. I just think there's so many opportunities that we are so distracted by maintaining the status quo that the world is hurting. And the church, they don't go to the church not because the church isn't physically present, but they don't go to the church because the church is so distracted that we're not doing a good job loving people. Thank you, for, thank you for taking the time and sharing your passion with us. I appreciate it. We have a video, a budget video coming. Once more, I bring you greetings from your Conference Council on Finance Administration. We are in an exciting time in our conference. We have a new bishop who has been listening deeply to the hopes and dreams that we have for our ministries and who has been listening and sharing her hopes and dreams for our future as well. We are continuing to live into the vision of ending spiritual and physical hunger led by the faithful work of our churches in collaboration with our community partners. Leaders throughout our conference have determined that coming out of the isolation of a global pandemic does not mean going back to doing things the way we have always done them in the past. And together, we are finding new ways to build community. We got the wrong videos. <laughs> the correct one is coming up. <laughs> Was on it, <laughs> One of the questions I feel is posed to us by this soil is what would it look like for the church to be known as a place that knew something about rest? About renewal? About regeneration? We began the Content program because we really heard from a lot of people that were asking questions about call, a ministry, what it is to lead the church, that they were needing space to be able to process those questions and to do that in a way that they're not isolated or sort of siloed in that work, but that they can do it together in community. So Contend is structured in three phases. The first is called Explore, which meets here on site at Normal Heights United of people asking questions about, am I called to lead the church? The second phase is called Embody, where we go on contextual learning trips. We take the entire cohort with us, pretty much everything is paid for, and over a weekend we really inhabit a metaphor for call, for ministry, for church, for leadership. I am fond of telling seminary students that if they can learn to preach half as well as a compost pile, they're going to be great. 
one of the things it seems to say is death doesn't get the last word. Mm -hmm. Apostol taken into itself all these things that are passing away for the sake of new life in another season. Ah, oh, that smells good. It smells so good. We spent time today thinking about vocational journeys, working the farm, but a core question that we were wrestling with is faith in an exhausted world. Has the church been complicit in the world's exhaustion? What would it look like to tip the scales? Is it possible the whole creation is waiting for that church? My name is Tatum Trakarico and my pronouns are she, her. I'm getting my Master's of Divinity and my hope is to become a pastor. I'm really interested in disability justice and theology. My name is Luke Melanakos Harrison. I'm graduating right now with my Master's of Divinity and looking to continue my community organizing work, organizing tenant unions and fighting for housing justice. I think Contend has really been a space for me to experiment with what a call to ministry is like. A lot of times I do disability justice and I do theology. Through the Contend program, I've really got to see how those can fit together. Vocation doesn't have to be this one like straight line that is like, I get this job and then I get this job and then I'm there, but instead can have these like little like creative pockets. Each of these weekend trips has been for me a chance to really step back and reflect on my life and my journey. I feel like I know the kind of work I want to do, but what I still want to reflect on is like, what kind of life do I want to live? What, what kind of rhythm of life? I think there are so many people who do feel a large call in their life to lead the church. And a lot of folks have not felt like they're allowed to be in leadership, whether it's because they're like me, they're a woman, or because they're queer. I feel like Norma Heights United Church is sort of uniquely situated to be able to host something like this. As a church, we're very open. Um, we are very permission giving with ministries and with ideas. When we talk about new prophetic expressions of the church, the church needs to shift and grow around these people who are coming with amazing ideas and asking these big questions. They're the ones that need to lead us into the future. The third phase is called ENACT, and that is more one-on-one -on -one coaching and mentorship, access to resources, help with grant writing, as people have a clearer idea of what it is they're called to. Through the three years that I've been in this program, I've had a lot of different ideas about what I was gonna do, and it's been there the whole time as a place where that was totally okay to come and sort of process wherever I was at in my journey with others who were also doing the same. It's been so fun to see everyone. I think, um, yeah, getting to hear about where their call is taking them. I think it's incredibly important to have that community. I would say to all those people that are, are wondering maybe if they have a call to ministry, even just that slightest little whisper, the first phase of Contend really is just giving you space to explore that question, to wrestle with it, to nurture it. And to do that in community is incredibly fun and it helps you really make connections with the folks that you can lean on to help sort and understand what you're being called to do. Thank you for that great video. I would like to call upon our Chancellor, Lori Meters, to come and give us a report. And uh, before she does, I just want to uh, say a word of thanks for the work that she does. Uh, you know, she... She protects us, she guides us, she advises us. She is uh, central to who we are. So thank you, Lori, for all your work. Thank you, Bishop. I really appreciate that. Um, and I know we're running a bit behind. Uh, and so the last thing you want is have a lawyer standing in the way of your lunch. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to abbreviate my comments of what I had planned here. And I'll just touch on a few highlights. Uh, we all know there's a lot affecting our church as a whole right now. Uh, on a lot of people's mind, first and foremost, is disaffiliation. And you're aware that there are churches many churches across our country have requested or are in the process of or already have completed a disaffiliation with their conference. Um, some of them have gone on to join the Global Methodist Church, the new denomination. 
Some churches have, have gone to other denominations, and some have elected just to remain independent. So it varies across the nation. There's a lot of press out there. I, I get summaries of press on, on a regular basis. And it's very interesting to read because you see that not everything out there that you read is accurate. <laughs> um, surprise. <laughs> so, uh, and you also see that a lot of things that come across, you know, it'll be put out by, let's say, the AP, and it was even happened in our local Pasadena newspaper. Uh, you see this report come across, and then um, people get alarmed, and it's, they're giving just a snapshot of what's really going on. And so just be cognizant of that as you read materials. Right now, uh, some of the churches that have attempted to disaffiliate have elected to litigate against their conference. There's six or seven conferences that are actively in litigation right now. I think some have settled, maybe one or something. But that is where across the nation we are. And our conference has received interest. Um, we're not as heavily impacted as some of the conferences out there. And I Thank you, Lord, for that. <laughs> Helps my job. <laughs> but we do have maybe about 20 churches that have expressed interests, and our board of trustees uh, have a policy or have the procedures in place to work with these churches, and they are actively working with them right now, and that's where we presently stand. And in November, we'll have our next annual conference to be able to address those churches who work their way through this process. Great. I'm now going to quickly go on to Boy Scouts because that's in a, a lot of people have, an, have Boy Scout groups at their churches and are familiar with what's going on out there. Just to say that the, you're aware of the bankruptcy procedures that went through. Um, the reorganization was finally approved by the judge on April 19th. So the settlement trust was effectively and immediately opened that day by the Boy Scouts. They wanted to move this thing along quickly, so they already started. They're pulling all the horses together. And so our conference now is in the process of, will be um, soon funding our share of the settlement trust. The United Methodist Church as a whole is contributing $30 million. The total trust is about 2.4 billion, if I recall. So it's a huge trust. There are a lot, a lot of claimants in it. Um, some of our local churches have actually been hit in the past year with lawsuits from some of these former Boy Scouts. Now, part of the process of this Boy Scout reorganization and participating in the settlement trust is that they are not supposed to prosecute, or, or excuse me, but um, file claims and, and against um, the church or the conference or any other organization that they have, uh, have a claim against potentially. But in the state of California and a few other states across our nation, the claims, uh, they, they extended, the, the state extended the statute of limitations for filing claims for those individuals who had been impacted by sexual abuse as a child or as a, as, a, as a youth. So they are allowed to file a claim to protect their rights under that extended statute of limitations. The statute of limitations was in place through December 31st, 2022. So last year was the last date. But we still have some cases rolling in, even as recently as a few weeks ago. So although they filed the claim, it takes a while to get through the court and then get served on the church, on the conference. So for those churches who have been, um, I've been working with you, <laughs> um, but they come in and they're just, they're just going to be placed on hold right now. So we don't have to worry about them. And hopefully everything will continue to go smoothly with the Boy Scout settlement. Unfortunately, on the Boy Scout settlement, there are a couple of the big insurers who don't like the settlement, and they have in the process of appealing. So it's not a done, done deal, but we pray that it will continue just to work its way through. Now, on another front, as far as that extension on the statute of limitations, we have numerous churches that have been hit by other litigation, specifically to their church, not Boy Scout related, 
but old claims um, indicating that they were abused by either a clergy or a volunteer at the church. And these go back many years. We're talking most of them are like 1970s, 80s. So we have six local churches that have received claims over a total of, um, we have 14 right now, claimants. And that is the very sad, sad news. When you read through these things, some of the allegations are questionable, some of the facts don't hold together, and some of them you look at and you say, yeah, that was probably the case. And it's just very, very sad. Now, another sad part is on the financial side is that these things take a long time to go through. It's a lot of legal expense. And the claims are substantial. There are um, demands of $6 million per person, $5 million per person. They're very, very high. We've already settled two of the, sm the smallest claims. So we've got two of them done. So we're in the process. But this is going to take um, a bit of time. And as I said, it's expensive. So that is something that dear Archana is working with on the, tr on the uh, financial side. Um, we have insurance, kind of, for some. And there is an insurance for others. And this is a thing I, I, I plead with each of the churches Keep track of your insurance, because what's happening now is we're getting these claims, and they go back, well, I say, 50 years. In fact, one of the Boy Scouts goes back to the 1950s. And the, you have to know who your insurer is in order to be able to file a claim with that insurer. And some of the, you know, many times, churches don't have those records. Conference doesn't have the records. Who, you know, going back that far, and that's a real challenge. And so for those that we have the records, we, we do have one insurer that's working with us. And sometime, and now this nice insurer is actually suing the conference to try to get out of having to, to uh, cover us. Yeah, so you get it from all sides. But so whatever your records are, try to look for them. Because um, some of these insurance uh, as well, even if you find them, we found that the insurer has gone out of business. And then, so to the extent we have insurance, they at least pick up all the defense costs. And then you hope that they will help cover any settlement there might be. To the extent there isn't, just put it on your radar, the conference is ahead, sees ahead some, um, a bit of a rocky road on the financial side. So sorry to bring the bad news right before lunch, but that's it. Thank you, Bishop. <laughs> Well, it feels good to stand up. <laughs> I, I want to um, respond to the news that Lori has given us about the, the lawsuits. And I want to say that we take them um, seriously. We take them um, at, to our hearts. We care about the harm that has happened in the past. And we care about caring for those folks and we know that God is with them and with us as we go forward and find ways to assist in this process. So um, I also want to just say pastorally to all of us church folk, um, to part of being in community is to really care for each other and to be protective in your own circles so that um, children can be protected. So I call on you to, to do your work wherever you are to uh, help us to be a community that does good everywhere and does no harm. So I would like to pray, us to pray. Lori, come stand, Lori, come stand by me. God, thank you so much for Lori, for the, the things she manages and handles and sees the things she um, takes care of for us. And I pray, God, that you would be with her as she goes through these processes of helping us to move forward. And give her the wisdom she, she has to continue, uh, continue to, uh, to help us with the settlements. 
and just give her joy somewhere else in her life <laughs> where she can have the gift of, of uh, return for all that she has given. And God, I pray for us, the church. I pray that we would continue to be transparent and responsible and caring and loving. We ask this in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to call Bob to give us instructions before lunch, and then Reverend Lupita Alonso Redondo is coming up for our prayer. So if you could get ready for that, Lupita. Are you all ready for lunch? Yes. Excellent. Uh, now, I'm not going to tell you how to eat lunch, but I am going to tell you how to exit this room. Uh, if you are going to the missions lunch, just like always, you're going to want to head out the back doors. You're going to head out to the back doors and head to my left, that direction that I'm pointing. Uh, if you are going elsewhere for lunch, including the brasserie, you can go out these doors on the side. I know some of those doors say to go to the back. Don't pay attention. Go out those doors. Please do not go out these doors to my left. Now, in the spirit of recognizing that we are connected with folks online, I hope you have your own directions to go to lunch, but know that our hearts and our spirits are with you. Uh, microphone for, for our prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Vamos a orar por los alimentos. Señor, te damos gracias. Tú eres un Dios proveedor. Y siempre estás atento a nuestras necesidades. Te pedimos que a través del alimento que vamos a recibir, podamos ser nutridos para seguir adelante con el trabajo que tú nos has encomendado y que tengamos conciencia de aquellos que no tienen el privilegio que nosotros tenemos, aquellos que batallan para traer un alimento digno a su mesa, aquellos que todavía no pueden um, proveer para sus familias uh, la clase de nutrición que realmente necesitan. Te pedimos por todas las familias que batallan uh, para traer comida a sus mesas, te damos gracias por los que preparan los alimentos y te damos gracias también, Señor, porque nos das para que nosotros demos y eso es un gran privilegio. We thank you, God, for the meals that we're about to receive and also for uh, the opportunity that you're giving us to be mindful of those who may be struggling to get a decent meal on their tables. Mm -hmm. For those m families that are struggling to bring meats to the families. For all those migrants that today are just gonna eat a, a piece of sandwich and a fruit and, a, and some juice. Lord, you are Jehovah Yireh. You provide. And just, we ask that as you nourish us uh, through the meal that we're receiving today, that you will teach us, that you give us so that we can give, so that we can provide for others. Keep us mindful that you have entrusted into our hands people who are loved by you, no matter where they come from, no matter where their walk of faith is. Bless us. Bless the people that prepare, prepare the meals. And bless our leadership, Lord, and, I, and our laity as we move forward on the task that you have entrusted to us. We thank you. Te damos gracias en nombre de nuestro Señor. Amen. 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 See you too.